Now, women in South Africa are dying increasingly violent deaths, often at the hands of their intimate partners. According to the latest statistics, more than 900 women were killed in the last three months. Activists say a holistic approach is needed to halt the murders. Let's discuss this topic with Brenda uh, Madumise Pajibo. She's a women's rights activist and director of Wise Africa. Thank you so much for speaking to us, Brenda. I think we've had this conversation so many times before, but what brought uh, the team to, um, you know, dis discussing it and asking that you come on the show was, of course, the news that that six-year-old little girl who was found mutilated and raped allegedly by three men, one of the accused is someone who was in uh, the correctional services system twice and still given parole. Yeah, um, it's so surprising. Uh, and uh, when we advocated for uh, a holistic approach to how you address and attend to gender-based violence, it's exactly that. Because you would remember uh, during COVID in 2020, they, uh, the Department of Correctional Services was, wanted to decant the correctional services and place number of inmates on parole. And the question that we posed to the, to the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services at the time was, what criteria are you following in releasing some of these um, prisoners? Because our view is that those who have been convicted of serious crimes, whether it's murder, whether it's femicide, whether it's, it's gender-based violence around rape, sexual assault, they should not be eligible for parole precisely because you have not put systems in place to ensure that they cannot be repeat offenders, right? And, and that's the challenge with this country, that you don't have a register that you and I can monitor to ensure that once an individual, a, a parolee, is released from prison, um, that we can track their movement and ensure that everyone in the community is aware that this individual is a sexual offender or, in fact, that he has committed a crime. Most people don't know, uh, unless a victim of, of that violent crime is the one who comes out to say, this person has been released and is back in my community. So it's, it, you know... Um, we, we are addressing gender-based violence in piecemeal and, 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 and very, in, a, in, a, in a very fragmented way. So there's no coordination of all the efforts. And I think that's why we don't see the impact that mm. we should be making in addressing this sketch, precisely because it's, it's very fragmented. Mm. Uh, now, you know, looking at the fact that we've had a GBV summit with the president before, what happened to that? Yeah. What are some yeah. of uh, the positives we can draw from that since it first happened? So the positives out of that 2018 summit in November was that you had a team of dedicated activists uh, working closely with government to craft what we, we now have as the National Strategic Plan on Gender-Based Violence. That document is what coordination is all about. It was supposed to foster and force and force all of us to coordinate our, the, our responses, our, our resources, and everything else. As we speak today, that document was adopted and delivered to government in 2019, if I'm not mistaken, April, end of April, right? Or in fact, 2020, in fact, I think, we just at the start of COVID. Uh, and we are in 2022, uh, and we still don't have the structures that are supposed to be in, in place to ensure that coordination, um, multi-sectoral approach to addressing gender-based violence is a reality. And so this government that pronounces itself on a daily basis on uh, gender-based violence being a pandemic, their response is totally different from responding to a pandemic. If mm. we responded to COVID the way we responded and called it a pandemic, uh, and we, we marshaled resources, we had um, uh, uh, national um, committees, we had the war rooms and whatnot. We have not done that with GBV. And maybe it's time that this government does exactly that and we are going to push them to respond to gender-based violence with agency because they keep on placating and appeasing and saying the right things all the time, but their response 
totally misaligned to what they say on a daily basis. Mm. And in terms of, you know, we've uh, spoken before about what government can do, what law enforcement can do, etc. Um, you know, in terms of uh, the women, the, the department that was responsible for the rights of women and children in the presidency, a lot of people have said how, um, you know, they're not available or they're not seen to be doing anything, at least in the public. Uh, but also there is, you know, this um, D, D, uh, there's this, what's happening is that a lot of people are no longer um, as moral enough to actually even tell each other when they are wrong. Oh, absolutely. And I think they, they, the, the, the National Strategic Plan on, on Gender-Based Violence, it, its key focus was on prevention. If we did some of the interventions and executed some of the interventions that were identified in the National Strategic Plan on prevention, we'll be talking a different, we'll be having a different conversation you and I today. Because if we don't expand the resources on prevention, we'll continue to have these conversations and you'll keep on calling us to come and talk about the same thing over and over again. Because prevention has to go hand in hand with your responses as the South African Police Service, as the, as, as the court system. All of that has to be coordinated and working well together. We need a swift, uh, seamless processes in how you uh, arrest, how you uh, cases are reported. And, and at the moment, it's, it's a hazard. It depends. Mm. Where in, 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 in this particular province, they do things in, in this way. In another province, another way. We have to have a seamless system that everyone understands, and, and, and especially the South African Police Service, because at any given time, they mm. interpret the laws the way they want to. And even the applications of, the, of, the, of those laws, they choose how to, how to apply them. So we, right. we, we, we have to spend resources and time on prevention. Yeah, definitely. Um, now, a lot of people would say, you know, just to go back to the incident of, um, you know, this uh, Buntle Mashiani, uh, who was found right. mutilated and murdered by a person who was out on parole twice. There's also the Kailicha issue, people who are committing crimes and Kailicha being found to have been out on parole as, as well. Uh, you know, the, the, does this not also bring back a pros possibly the debate of the death penalty? Definitely. And that's something there's a, there are strong advocates on social media on bringing the death penalty. Um, and, and I think, you know, the, the question that we should be asking ourselves, what is the purpose of punishment, right? Um, punishment is supposed to serve as, as a deterrent, right? Uh, you and I, with our children, we know how, how to punish a child and hoping that that behavior will stop. Right or that uh, you know, um, so is the death penalty an answer to um, deterring people from committing acts of of, of, of violence against others or murdering uh, and, and remembering that almost all most people uh, are Christians in this country and they read the Bible and the Bible says thou shalt not kill but people do kill and we have mm. killed in the name of God um, for you know during apartheid to get the land and everything else. So for, for, for all of us, needs, we need to ask the, ourselves the question, what is the purpose of punishment? What is, you know, is it retribution? Is it reformatory? Is it a deterrent? And once we are able to answer what is the purpose with punishing people who wrong other members of society, then we are able to respond and respond with, with, with appropriate interventions. At the moment, yeah. I think we're emotional and we're angry and justifiably so uh, mm -hmm. that people think that, once there's a death penalty, because of its, its um, you know, not gruesomeness, but I mean, it's final. Once you say someone is, is um, mm -hmm. a death penalty has been, it's, it's final. Maybe I would not want to be, um, to be, uh, be um, a subject of, of, of a death penalty. I will re refrain from behaving in a particular way. So we need yeah. to be asking us this question. Maybe the debate should happen in this country on whether there is room for us to, have this conversation in the light of the constitution that we have exactly. remember our constitution is very clear on on death penalty so uh are we are we advocating for a an amendment of the constitution i don't think we should stop the the, the conversations we must have it but it must be a sober uh, a discussion conversation that is devoid of of emotions 
Mm. Well, you sit with a lot of uh, policy makers from different um, government departments when it comes to the fight against uh, women and child abuse, etc. Um, so as you sit with them in these meetings that you have, what kind of pressure do you apply, um, you know, in terms of them actually doing what they promise in the fight against um, these pandemics? You, we, we know the first pressure that was applied was in 2018. I mean, there was a protest action across across the country. Multitudes of women came out in their numbers to say, we cannot continue to live in a country that espouses values of right to life, a right to privacy, right to, to be heard, and we, we are being mauled and murdered and, and violated and sexually violated on a daily basis. So that was the first pressure that was, that was, that was, that, that was uh, exerted on government. And I think the mistake that we made was to take the foot of, of the pedal um, and, 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 and that led them to relax. And, and so now we have realized that you have relaxed. Now we are, we are now back to accelerating and putting the pressure. So we are not giving them the, the space to breathe as, as government because we need answers, we need responses uh, immediately. And, and that's where we are. And, and um, if, if they are not going to be satisfactory responses. I mean, we can't have a country where, um, you know, uh, the, the, the burden is, is placed on women to always talk about what they go through and the trauma and, and the violence that, that they live with on a daily basis. And the other part of society is, is standing by and watching and, 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 and commenting and, 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 and asking you the question, why did you stay in that relationship that was abusive, mm. right? And not not having the right conversations on, on why is that man finding it necessary to be violent in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. So we now have decided that we are now piling the pressure on, on the decision makers, all the policy makers. We, 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 we put the foot uh, back and we, we, we did not accelerate. Now we are going to accelerate. They might not like what is coming out, but that's the only way for them to listen because they only listen once they are um put under pressure and we can't mm. have a country that is run along those lines you can't it, it must be natural and 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 a, 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 a normal for someone who's working in government to respond and do their work and their job well and do it well you mm. know well thank you so much for speaking to us brenda uh, once again it's always good to have you on the show all ang uh, on all angles that is uh, brenda matumise pajibo she's a women's rights activist and director of wise africa